This video is a review of the My Voice booklet, Guide to Advanced Care Planning, published by the BC Government. My name is Joanne Taylor. I'm the Executive Director and Registrar of NIDIS. This presentation is basic information. It is not legal advice. We have other videos covering other aspects of personal planning. NIDIS is a BC-wide, non-profit charitable organization established in 1995 by other community groups who had been involved in a grassroots law reform of adult guardianship. Out of that law reform came the Representation Agreement Act and healthcare consent legislation, and NIDIS was set up as a resource on the new laws. We also provide a registry service to help communicate important information and documents. Our name, NIDIS, is Latin for nest. We like the symbolism of support and safety. Members of NIDIS were involved in the drafting of the Representation Agreement Act, and we've provided public education on planning since the law was passed in 1993. We have a practice advisory group that helps us uh, with best practices and ensuring our information is current and accurate. NIDIS is recognized as the Center for Excellence in Personal Planning and Supported Decision Making. Some terminology to set the scene. This is a chart showing uh, types of planning and we have estate planning which is about making arrangements for after death and then there's personal planning which is about making arrangements for while you are alive and that's where we want to put the spotlight. You will see there are four uh, boxes, containers, health, personal, legal, financial and those represent the four life areas. We don't live our life in separate compartments, but there are laws and policies specific to those areas. And then we have a container attached to health called advanced care planning. And that's the term that the Ministry of Health and Health Authorities are using to encourage people to plan for health care matters. We take a broader view, so we're using the term personal planning, because it isn't only about health care or the care system. All life areas are related, and we want to ensure that people take care of all four life areas in their planning. Because of the law reform, we have two paths for personal planning in British Columbia. We have the future path, which is the traditional path for adults who understand the nature and effect of the documents uh, they're making at the time they're making them. And there's another path for adults whose capability to understand the nature and effect of the documents may be in question at the time that they're making them. And we call that the Need Help Today path. And this path may apply to adults with a disability from birth, adults who have advanced dementia, or just had a serious stroke. There are different legal tools depending on the path. So people on the future path can make a representation agreement section 9 that is the most comprehensive planning document for health and personal care matters. And for legal and financial affairs, they can make the enduring power of attorney, which is the most comprehensive planning document for those areas. There's an OR under Enduring Power of Attorney and under Legal and Financial because some people may be able to use the Representation Agreement Routine Financial and Legal uh, Authorities under Section 7. 
the majority of people will make an enduring power of attorney to cover legal and financial, but some people might use the other tool. For people on the Need Help Today path, they may make a Representation Agreement Section 7, which covers some aspects of all four life areas. Planning for incapacity, end of life, and other support needs is a new and emerging area for law and health care. It is new to both disciplines and NIDIS is trying to bridge the gap. We have important experience and knowledge to share from our work with the public and the feedback in this presentation is about how we can do it better together. We have some comments on the My Voice booklet, which was produced in 2012 by the Ministry of Health. We volunteered in 2011 to work with the Ministry on this booklet, but they decided to do it themselves. And it provides information to explain the forms that the government produced uh, to go along with advanced care planning. However, there are some challenges with this resource. It's confusing, as told by healthcare providers in the public. Some information is not accurate. The forms are not as accessible as intended. And we um, were called by the Ministry of Health uh, about some of the problems, so we know they're aware of them, and we understand this resource is being revised. We've identified some specific items, as people have asked, well, what do you mean? So we found that the definitions used in the text do not always match those in the glossary. The definitions and examples about representation agreements are not accurate according to the legislation. There is no requirement for someone to be assessed before making a representation agreement, Section 7 or Section 9, as it suggests on page 11. A representation agreement, Section 7, has a different view of capability. It does not have any specific criteria. The law provides factors as examples. And some of the information in my voice um, is not from the law. So we're wondering why it's listed if it's not required, because that adds to the confusion. The definition of power of attorney is incomplete. Uh, there's no mention that a power of attorney ends if you become mentally incapable. You need to know that if you're planning. The definition of enduring power of attorney is inaccurate. It doesn't provide the uh, recommendation from legal experts and NIDIS that you can say in your enduring power of attorney that it's in effect while you're capable and can continue if you become incapable, and that's very important for conditions such as dementia, uh, which is not black and white in terms of capability. It fluctuates, so it's very helpful to know that it can say it's in effect when you're capable and will continue to be in effect if you become incapable. My voice lists the definition of incapable incapability, but doesn't make it clear that the definition uh, is for uh, whether or not someone can make informed consent to health care. Uh, it's not about the planning documents, and it just needs to be uh, clear as to what it's referring to. My voice discusses making changes to a representation agreement. However, that's uh, quite complex and not advised in legal practice. If you need to change the people in your agreement, you need to 
revoke or cancel the old one and make a new one. If you are making changes to contact information, you never alter the original. You can make changes on photocopies, but that's not discussed in the booklet. Information is provided in my voice on how to revoke, cancel a representation agreement or an advance directive, but it's misleading because there are different procedures for each of these types of documents. Uh, the information isn't clear on what applies to which document, so people might make a mistake. I think one of the most uh, confusing aspects of the resource is that my voice includes information on the default scheme, if there is no plan, as well as on how to plan and the tools you can use. But it's hard to tell the difference between them uh, because it's all mixed up together in the um, booklet and in the examples. Uh, for example, there's a place to list the default temporary substitute decision maker TSDM scheme. And this is misleading in the sense that a TSDM is selected by the healthcare provider, not the adult. Um, listing the people makes it look as if you're appointing them. So a little bit of information for those of you who are new to the TSDM default scheme. A temporary substitute decision maker is the name role given to the person selected when someone is needed to make a decision for an adult who has been determined incapable of consent and there is no representation agreement. The list of people who can be selected as a TSDM is provided in the law and the health care provider must follow it in a particular order. So it starts with next of kin, your spouse is first. Um, and if you don't have any next of kin, then they move on down the list. And the last resort will be a staff person, bureaucrat, with the public guardian and trustees office. My voice has no discussion on the limitations of the TSDM role. For example, uh, TSDM has temporary authority, that's in the name, temporary substitute decision maker. A TSDM can only refuse life supporting health care if a majority of the medical team agrees. Uh, the book doesn't explain that a spouse has more authority as a representative than as a TSDM. TSDMs are restricted from making decisions listed in the Healthcare Consent Regulation, Section 5. Uh, notice of incapability must be completed by a healthcare provider if they select a TSDM to make a decision about major healthcare. And after the instruction to list their TSDM, people are uh, asked to tick agree and sign and date a statement about it. And this is on page 29. There's nothing in the law regarding this. So what does it mean? How will it be used? Are healthcare providers going to use it if someone complains they were not selected as a TSDM? Your mother didn't list you on the form? This approach is likely to incur more risk than benefit for a healthcare provider or institution. In another example, uh, the story about Jenny uh, does not explain some important realities. Her family doctor is not likely to be contacted if Jenny has a heart attack, and yet the example uh, put a lot of emphasis on her discussions with her family doctor. If she has a heart attack, she will most likely be under the care of a hospitalist in the hospital. Her advance directive is not likely to be adequate for all circumstances that may arise and it may be difficult for a hospitalist to interpret her instructions because they weren't part of any discussions uh, with her. So the hospital will have to select a TSDM 
And if they can't reach any family or a close friend or in-law, then they must contact a staff person in the public guardian and trustee's office. And they often take a little bit of time because they have to um, read the information. And they have a policy that they don't refuse life-supporting health care on someone's behalf. My Voice gives many examples of using advanced directives. However, it's actually very difficult to write a valid advanced directive. But that's not discussed. The My Voice booklet is very prescriptive about components of an advanced care plan, at least from the uh, system's perspective. The emphasis is on wishes, yet these can backfire. It's also important that the resource recognize that personal planning happens in a variety of settings, in the community, with legal professionals, with financial institutions and advisors, and they won't all follow the My Voice prescription. So uh, healthcare providers are going to have to uh, know that and be prepared for a variety of uh, documents or formats. We have tried in this presentation to give some specific examples, but it won't be sufficient to simply um, fix the items discussed. The booklet needs a different approach. As I said, we understand the My Voice booklet is being revised by the Ministry of Health. However, we remain concerned that the perspective will be too narrow and may not accurately reflect an understanding of representation agreements and healthcare consent requirements. It is true that the legislative framework has become more complex than the community-based law reform ever imagined or envisioned. However, the complexity can be made more accessible when resource materials are relevant and based on real-life experiences and public concerns. Uh, it isn't about the number of pages, it's about the clarity and accuracy of the information. We have heard that some healthcare providers want a rewrite of My Voice to be like the original version uh, put out by Fraser Health Authority. This would not be helpful as those previous materials were not consistent with the law. The uh, Fraser Health version also used phrases like, if the doctor thinks. Uh, this could lead to more court cases like the one about Margot Bentley who uh, has since died but was in a care facility in Fraser Health Authority. Um, and her wishes were interpreted differently by medical staff and other professionals than by her spouse and family who she discussed them with. And just to note, she did not have a representation agreement. It was not available at the time when she did her planning. We would recommend that there be two or maybe three booklets produced on um, personal planning based on the concepts of the future path and the need help today path to be consistent with the legislative framework. The government representation agreement forms also need revision to be more accessible and reflect best practice and you can watch the video with feedback on the government forms. And of course, the guides and forms need to allow for the evolving and dynamic nature of personal advanced care planning uh, to bring them, keep, keep them uh, up to date with the current practice. And just to let you know where you could find uh, information on the NIDAS website, if you go to nidas.ca, you'll see our home page, and there are three photos and headings. For those of you on the future path, you will click the middle photo and heading to find information and links. If you're helping an adult who has a disability from birth or childhood that affects their capability to understand nature and effect, you click the first photo or heading. And if you're helping an adult with advanced dementia or serious stroke, other condition, and they don't have any legal plans in place, you click the third photo and heading.
Thank you for joining us. Please go to the website, uh, watch other videos.